वंदाहम Prayer Divya Desham Badam the Chauram Shri Radhikaya Hridayasya Chauram Nilam Bujasya Malakanti Chauram Chaura Graganyam Purusham Namami Aho Chitram Aho Chitram Bande Tat Prema Bandhanam Yad Badham Muktidam Muktam Brahma Krida Brigi Kritam Yo Brahmanam Vidadhati Purvam Yo Vai Vedanscha Prahinoti tasmai Tagvang ha deva matma buddhi prakasham Mumukchurvai Sharanamaham prapadye The Divine Souls in the last few speeches I was explaining to you about the path of karma and you learned that the path of karma on its own is incomplete because it cannot take us all the way to God realization. Yesterday I began explaining about the path of jnana and we will find that the path of jnana is very similar to the path of karma in this way that it is also incomplete without bhakti. Just as we need to add bhakti to karma to make it karma yoga, then we can reach God through karma yoga, not through karma on its own. In the same way, we can reach God through jnana yoga, which means we have added bhakti to our jnana, path of jnana. Then it becomes the path of jnana yoga, and that can take us to God. So yesterday I was showing you some scriptural references where there were many seeming contradictions where on one hand our scriptures are very highly praising the path of Gyan and on the other hand they seem to be criticizing it. So to understand this let's first look at this fact that there are two types of Gyan. There is Shabda Gyan and there's anubhavatma jnana. In other words, there's theoretical knowledge and there is actual experience. The knowledge you get from experience, experiential knowledge. Jnana means knowledge, but one should not think that knowledge is exclusive to the path of jnana. It is also required for the path of bhakti and it is also required for the path of karma. However, since the approach to God 
is a little more intellectual on the path of Gyan, so we call it the path of Gyan. There are two types of Gyan, theoretical and experiential. Theoretical knowledge is always meant to lead to experience. Theoretical knowledge is never an end in and of itself. You gain the theory so that you can put it into practice and then have the experience. This goes for the world as well as for God. You see, you can teach a parrot to say, there are sweet fruit in the jungle. There are many types of sweet fruit in the jungle. You can train him to say that and he can go on saying it but if he doesn't actually understand what he's saying, then is he ever going to fly into the jungle to eat those fruit? No. Similarly, we can have all kinds of scriptural knowledge in our mind, but if that scriptural knowledge doesn't lead to a desire for God, then what is the, what is the value of that knowledge? All the spiritual knowledge is for one thing. Sarve Vedayat Padamamananti, Kathopanishad says, every mantra of every Ved is only to take you towards God. Sa Vidya Tan Matiryaya, Vedavyasji writes in the Bhagavatam that that is true knowledge which leads to love for God. Theoretical knowledge on its own, you see, let's say someone learns the Gita. They may learn, memorize many shlokas of the Gita, be able to recite it. They may recite a shlok like the last teaching of Krishna's in the eight in the 18th chapter sarva dharman parityajya mamekam sharanam braj aham tvam sarva papebhyo mokchayishyami ma shucha we recite it but what is krishna saying in this shlok he's saying mamekam sharanam braj he's saying surrender to me wholeheartedly so now let's imagine we've memorized this shloka of the Gita and we feel proud that we know the Gita and now we're reciting it. Ma mekam sharanam braja. What's the sense in saying that? It's Krishna who said it and he was giving us a command to go to him, to surrender to him. So if we're re reciting this shloka yet not surrendering to Shri Krishna, what is the value of that theoretical knowledge? In fact, it could be called the opposite of knowledge. It could be called ignorance because such knowledge which leads to pride actually makes us farther from surrendering to God. So the so-called spiritual knowledge that we gain by studying Gita or Vedas or Brahma Sutra or great writings of saints if when we gain that knowledge we end up with a pride of knowing then we were better off before we had that knowledge because we may not have had any knowledge of spiritual theoretical things but at least we were probably humble and we could have cried tears before God now that we have this knowledge we may get a pride that I know something I'm a knowledgeable person and we may assume that that automatically makes us spiritual and closer to God yet we would be mistaken because such pride makes us farther from God as soon as we have a pride in anything it makes us uh, lose our drive to surrender to God when we're humble then we have a desire to surrender to God so this is part of the answer. Why do our scriptures on one hand criticize Gyan? Part of the reason that criticism is there is actually for such people who would study our 
Sanskrit scriptures just to gain that theoretical knowledge and through that gain a pride, gain more ahankar and thus end up further from God. Criticism is for such practices and such people who would do such things. We don't want to be like Madan Mishra's parrots. He had two parrots, and Madan Mishra was a great scholar of his time, of the time of Jagadguru Shankaracharya. So in the house of Madan Mishra, there was always some scriptural talks going on, and many times lively debates about scriptural matters. Jagadguru Shankaracharya himself many times would go to Madan Mishra's home and debate with him. Madan Mishra's parrots, well, they heard all of this talk. So one day it was noticed that the parrots who would sit actually on the sill outside his house, they were also having a debate. One of them is saying, Ye sansar mithya hai. This world is fake. It doesn't really exist. And the other one says, Ni sansar satya hai. No, this world is real. And the first one responds, prove it, pramanado. And the second one says, abhi deitaun. I'm going to quote some scriptures right now to prove my point. So in other words, these parrots are arguing back and forth and discussing, but they don't actually know what they're talking about. Similarly, we may gain very impressive knowledge of the scriptures, which may be impressive to others, but what is that knowledge for? That knowledge is meant to be parlayed into an experience. If you find some kind of, uh, let's say you find a gold chain lying on the side of the road, and you pick it up and you think, oh, it must just be costume jewelry. No one would leave such a beautiful gold chain lying around if it was of any value. So you just take it and you toss it in your kitchen somewhere in some drunk junk drawer. Later on, you decide, oh, why don't I go down to the pawn shop and see how much it's worth? So you take it to the jeweler and you show him. And he says it's worth $20,000. It's real gold, 24 karat gold. All of a sudden, that has tremendous value for it. You hold that chain in your hands and you're thinking, oh, this is mine. It's worth so much money. In other words, instantly, once you had the knowledge of what that chain was worth, you became attached to it. Your love for it grew. What is the knowledge of our scriptures for? It is only for developing love for God. We should understand who he is, what is our relationship to him, what we will gain if we need him. If we truly understand these things, we will automatically develop a love for God and a desire to attain him. And this is true gyan. Now, if someone is going to apply this theoretical knowledge of our scriptures, in order to get experiential knowledge. Then we come to the next point where we have to understand that there are two types of experiential knowledge in the spiritual realm. One is called Atmagyan and one is called Brahmagyan. Atmagyan means knowledge of the soul and Brahmagyan, knowledge of God. On this path of Gyan, what one does, it's a meditation on formless God and trying to conceive the oneness of one's soul with the omnipresent divine truth, with omnipresent nirakar brahm. Nirakar brahm is an aspect of Shri Krishna. It's an aspect of God. The radiance of Bhagwan, you can say, it's not someone else. But Gyanis worship that formless aspect of Supreme God. As part of their path, there's eight steps described. 
first is Vivek, then Vairagya, then Shamadi, Shat, Sampatti, then Mumukchutva. These are the first four steps. Vivek means understanding the temporary nature of worldly pleasures and the fact that your soul is divine and related to God. So the soul cannot be satisfied by material pleasures. That's Vivek. Number two, Vairagya. Vairagya means not having attachment to worldly things. Shamadi Shat Sampatti. There's actually six characteristics of the mind that have to be developed, but we can just say in, in short, what it means is that the mind has to be fully under control. This is the third step of the path of Gyan. No desires, no attachments in the world, and total control over one's mind. No desire for praise, no desire for worldly enjoyments, just one desire. This is number four, mumukchutva, the desire for liberation, the desire for moksha. Once the jnani has passed these four stages, then and only then is he qualified for stage five, shravan, which means he gets to actually listen to what is nirakar brahm. His Guruji would then explain to him about formless God and how to meditate on formless God. Then comes step number six, manan. Manan means having listened to that philosophy, then you have to keep thinking about it over and over and over again in your mind. Step seven is nididhyasan, when that knowledge becomes very firm in the mind. And step eight is called samadhi. Samadhi means that you enter into a state of absorption, where the mind is fully absorbed in thinking of formless God. Along with this, as part of the meditation, the jnani starts by repeating a mantra, tattva masi, which means you are God. On the path of Gyan, the Gyani does not think about his relationship with God, but rather his oneness with God. Both are true. We have a relationship with God. He is greater than we are. We are only souls. He is the one giving life to us. Yet, at the same time, he also permeates us. There is no part of us that separate separate from him. He's everywhere. The jnani focuses on this second part, the oneness part, how soul and God, from one point of view, are absolutely one because God pervades our very soul. So he starts by meditating on this mantra, Tattva Masi, you are God. Then he graduates to Aham Brahmasmi, I am God. Once he passes that stage, then he just meditates on Brahmasmi. He removes the aham part, the I part. Then he removes the asmi part, and he just meditates on Brahm, Brahm consciousness. Then through that practice, he ends up in samadhi. Initially, the jnani's samadhi would be very shallow and last for a very short time but the more he practices the deeper the samadhi lasts the deeper the samadhi goes and the longer it lasts the jnani in order to successfully do this has to be completely away from the world I'll discuss this more in the speeches to come that the jnani cannot be involved in any way with family, friends, society, worldly entertainments, comforts, nothing. So the path of jnana must be practiced in an isolated place, away from everything. And it must be practiced all the time. You'll learn later when we discuss the path of bhakti that on the, on the path of bhakti, although you can meditate for long periods of time, but those living in the world who are also qualified to follow the path of bhakti, 
they may only meditate for a couple of hours every day and the rest of the day they're working walking talking living their life in the world they're also trying to remember God during that time but they're not sitting down and meditating with full attention but on the path of Gyan you have to be in meditation all day every day in order to progress and not just for one lifetime for many lifetimes you'll see when we discuss the path of bhakti that on the path of bhakti it's possible to attain God in one single lifetime of sincere practice even while living in the world as long as one follows the path wholeheartedly but on the path of gyan many many lifetimes are required and even during one lifetime the practice has to be continuous throughout all day every day practicing the samadhi if a jnani if someone is qualified to follow the path of gyan if they have reached that level of renunciation and then they succeed in in perfecting their samadhi and completely purifying their heart through this process then they attain what is called atma gyan their mind it's still material but it's been fully purified the mind contains sattva guna rajo guna and tamo guna the three qualities of maya in this state of atma gyan the mind of this jnani who is now called atma jnani has been fully purified but is still material so you can say his mind has been established in sattva guna rajo guna and tamo guna of maya have been fully subsided but they're still there as long as the mind is mayak all three gunas are going to be there sattva gun is now prominent and rajo gun and tamo gun they are there but only in a seed form they're fully subsided in the mind of the atma gyani now at this stage the atma gyani may feel that he has been liberated but he has not the atma gyani still has a material mind so he cannot call himself liberated liberated would mean that you are free from your mayak mind as well the gyani fully purified his mind and in this pure sattvic mind he receives the divine radiance of his own soul and he realizes the divinity of his own soul but he is still under the bondage of maya if that atma gyani were to die even having attained this state of pure sattvic mind he would be reborn so he hasn't been liberated at all he hasn't achieved the state of moksha and if he is reborn he'll be reborn in this world he may be reborn as an atma gyani if that were his state of mind at the time of his death of course he would still be in that state of mind but eventually an atma gyani will fall if he doesn't take the next step the next step rohit by brahma himself ेण परम पद पतंत्युष्मी he believes himself to be liberated because he's enjoying that sattvic state of mind and he thinks himself to be in some divine state then he falls why does he fall because the next stage is supposed to be that he surrenders to god he surrenders to the personal form of god 
In order to receive his grace, and only with his grace, can he be liberated from maya. So if he fails to surrender to God, he falls. Patanti, Brahma says. He falls from his sattvic state of mind, from his atma gyan state. He falls. Can you imagine? Nowadays in the world, people say, oh yes, he's self-realized, as if it's the ultimate attainment. Self-realization is atma gyan. You can become self-realized and again fall from that state and become a ordinary worldly person. In the Gita, it is described, Brahma Bhuta Prasannatma Nashochati Nakangchati Samah Sarveshu Bhuteshu Madbhaktim Labhate Param Shri Krishna says that when you reach that state of Atma Gyan, you have no desires, no attachments, you view all living beings the same. None is hateful or dear to you. You don't need anything from anyone. You're in a perfectly balanced state of mind. However, there's one more step to take. He says, Mad bhaktim labhate param. That atma jnani must now do bhakti. What is bhakti? Surrendering to God, surrendering to the personal form of God. So Shri Krishna calls this state of Atma Gyan Brahma Bhutavastha. And he says that's not the end. After attaining the state of Atma Gyan, you have to do Bhakti, which means the Gyani has to surrender his mind to Shri Krishna or to any personal form of God to receive their grace. Then Mad bhaktya labhate jnanam bhaktya maam abhijanati yavan yashchasmi tatvata tato maam tatvato gyatva vishate tadanantaram He says, then the jnani knows me in full. Abhijanati bhaktya through bhakti, maam abhijanati. Maam means mujhe. Through bhakti, the jnani knows me in full. See, there's janati and there's abhijanati. Before the jnani had anch of jnan because he knew his soul. And soul is anch of Bhagwan. So he knew, he had knowledge, but not full knowledge. Then when he did bhakti, he surrendered to Krishna. With his grace, he got abhijanati. He knew Shri Krishna, not just his own soul. So he knows God through God's grace. He gets brahma So brahma is attained through the grace of God. If the jnani doesn't surrender to God, doesn't do bhakti, he can never attain Brahma Gyan. He remains in that state of Atma Gyan. But he cannot remain in that state of Atma Gyan forever because his mind is still material. It contains sanskars from unlimited past lifetimes. And eventually some worldly sanskar will come and draw his mind towards the world. And that begins his slide down the slippery slope back into desiring the world. And he loses his state of Atma Gyan. Shreya Shrutim Shreya Shrutim Bhakti Mudasyate Vibho Klishyanti Ye Keval Bodha Labdhaye Te Shama Sau Kleshal Eva Shishyate Nan yadyatha sthula tu shavaghati naam. Bhagavatam. Veda Vyasji says, The jnani who believes he can attain Brahma Gyan, the jnani who believes he can liberate himself from Maya without doing bhakti, 
is as ignorant as the person who sees that, oh, someone over there is beating the rice. When you first cut the rice, then you take it, put it on something hard, and you beat it so that the actual edible part of the rice separates from the husk. And then when you're done, you leave the husk and the stems and everything behind, and you just take the edible part of the rice with you. So let's say a person has been watching, oh, that person beat those husks, and he got all that rice out of it. I'm also going to beat the husks. So he goes and starts beating those empty husks, thinking that he can also extract rice from them when the rice has already been extracted. So as ignorant as that person is, the jnani is a match for him if he thinks that he can get liberated without doing bhakti. So says Vedavyas. So now we understand another reason why our scriptures at certain places criticize gyan. The first reason was if someone just has theoretical gyan and never uses that to gain experiential gyan. The second reason is for the atma gyani who believes himself to be liberated and doesn't surrender to God, doesn't do bhakti, then that type of atma jnani is criticized by our scriptures that he will again fall into darkness. So we understand that the path of jnana is also dependent on the path of bhakti. The jnani on his own can rise to great heights. On his own he can cross many layers of maya. He can cross prithvi Jal, Tej, Vayu, Akash, all five of the sthul material elements, of the gross material elements. Then he can also cross, after crossing all these Panchamahabhut, he crosses Panchikarn, he crosses Panchatan Matra, all these layers of Maya. He crosses Ahankar. But there are two more layers to cross, Mahan and Prakriti, before he could be completely beyond Maya. But those two layers, Mahan and Prakriti, cannot be crossed by a Jnani on his own. The Atma Jnani gets past Ahankar, he cannot cross Mahan and Prakriti. Only with God's grace can you cross Mahan and Prakriti. Or to say it another way, there are two kinds of Maya. There is Jiva Maya and Guna Maya. Jiva Maya can be conquered by the Jnani on his own and is conquered by the Atma Jnani. But Guna Maya cannot be conquered without the grace of God. Jiva Maya is of two types Avaranatmika Maya and Vikshepatmika Maya. Avaranatmika Maya means Due to the effect of maya, we forget who we are. We forget our true identity as the soul, and then vikshepatmika maya causes us to become attached in the world. So the jnani can remove those attachments, and he can also gain the knowledge that I am the soul. He can remember his true identity as a divine soul. So he can defeat this Vikshepatmika Maya and Avaranatmika Maya. In other words, he defeated Jeeva Maya. But Guna Maya cannot be defeated through one's own effort. Sri Krishna tells us this in the Gita when he says, This Maya is mine. Daivi Hyesha Gunamayi Mama Maya Durat. He says, My Maya is Gunamayi. Gunamaya. That is Sri Krishna's Maya. And it is Daivi, his Daivi Shakti, God's own power. So if you could defeat Maya, it means you would have to be stronger than God. Because Maya functions with God's power and is God's power. Mayam tu prakritim vidyan mayinan tu maheshwaram shvetashvatropanishad. This maya is God's power. 
So Sri Krishna says, if you surrender to me, I'll take you across Maya. But without my grace, no one can cross Maya. It is uncrossable. So we understand that the jnani can only go so far under his own power. Then he requires God's grace. So he has to do bhakti to receive that grace. If he does bhakti, then he can attain atma gyan and he can become liberated. When he becomes liberated, he remains in his body for the duration of his destiny. If he was destined to live until the age of 54 and he becomes a Brahmagyani at the age of 34, he has to stay in his physical body for another 20 years and he remains in his body also still with the material mind because the Jnani never receives a divine mind. In the end, when he leaves his body, he leaves behind his physical body, he leaves behind his mind because it's also material, and he merges into formless God. Vishate tadanantaram gita. Shri Krishna says, then he enters into me. So like a drop of water merging into the ocean, that liberated soul merges into formless God, into Sri Krishna's formless aspect. And then he has no experience, absolute peace, no pain, no pleasure either, because he has no mind, so how will he experience? This is the state of liberation, which we'll learn, we'll learn more about in the speeches to come. In the speeches to come, we'll have to understand more about this path of Gyan in relation to the path of Bhakti. I've told you in gist what the path of Gyan is and what it gives, that it gives absolute liberation, Kaivalya Moch. Now we have to understand better that should we follow the path of Gyan or should we follow the path of Bhakti? We know that we need to add bhakti to the path of jnana, then it becomes jnana yoga, the yoga part being surrendered to God. But would it be better to just follow the path of bhakti yoga from the beginning? Or could we follow the path of jnana yoga? We have to have some comparison. We have to understand what is the qualification for the path of bhakti as compared to the qualification for the path of jnana. How difficult is it to follow the path of bhakti as compared to the path of jnana? What is the ultimate attainment that is possible through the path of bhakti as compared to the liberation that we attain through the path of jnana? All of these topics will be covered beginning with tomorrow's speech. Bulye Vrindavan Bihari Lal Ki Jai